the evolution of naval battle tactics over the past thousand years or so up until World War II can be split into so many periods with so many detailed discussions of exactly how variations in certain tactics were pulled off. And for that, you know, there are plenty of books to reread, and some of them will be linked in the description below. However, there are some broad themes that can be discussed relatively briefly, at least if we confine ourselves to the European and Mediterranean experience. If you dial the clock back all the way to the 10th century, you have a very interesting situation compared to what you might call classic ancient naval warfare, i.e. the Greeks and the Romans. Because back then, there were all sorts of interesting shipboard artillery devices. But by the 900s and the 1000s, most of Europe had pretty much lost the capability to do this. Apart from anything else, most of the ships were too small to think about mounting anything like a significantly heavy artillery piece anywhere high enough for it to be of any use. The sole sort of exception to this was the Byzantine Empire, or Byzantine, depending on how you want to pronounce it, and they had a bunch of tricks up their sleeve, not the least of which was Greek fire, but that influenced their tactics in a way that really deserves its own video at some point. For almost everybody else, the longest range weapon that you could reliably think to find on a ship would be a bow. There might be other projectile weapons in the forms of spears, javelins, fire darts, stones, literally hand-thrown rocks, but that was pretty much it as far as ranged combat went. In some theatres, particularly the Mediterranean where the galley still dominated, ramming was also a viable combat tactic, although obviously and necessarily somewhat short range, galleys did survive to a small degree on the coasts of Spain and France and even into the North Sea regions, but their use was less predominant than it was in the Mediterranean. And with most ships being, relatively speaking, compared to later ones, somewhat small, and the ammunition for the ranged weaponry not being especially capable of actually damaging the opponent's ship, unless it was some kind of flaming projectile, the most you could usually hope for in a ranged engagement was to debilitate enough of the ship's crew to make the next stage of the action somewhat easier. And that stage of the action was to board the enemy ship and fight it out hand to hand, effectively to fight as if you were in a land battle, only with a slightly increased risk of drowning. And thus, when ramming wasn't present, naval tactics effectively devolved into some flavour of get close to the enemy ship and butcher everybody aboard until they surrender or until they're all dead. But when we're talking about fleet actions, which is what we're going to be covering in this video because individual ship tactics could be as varied as there are grains of sand on the beach, there was a little bit more tactical subtlety than just sail up to the other person and hit them with your sword. For one thing, some ships were smaller, faster and more agile than others, and this meant that they could sustain a projectile bombardment of some kind to try and debilitate a larger ship's crew to keep them safe. And for another thing, unlike a land battle, where usually you would have two sides facing each other and if one side enveloped the other, things had gone horribly, horribly wrong, at sea, it was much easier to surround your opponent, especially if you had superior numbers, and even if you didn't, it was still somewhat easy to get local superiority, because of course if you have dozens of individual ships going all over the place, well each ship has two sides, it's a little bit more difficult to board from the bow or stern, but if you can get alongside a ship, or maybe you can put your bow against the side of an enemy ship, you're controlling the access points a little bit better, but you can double team them. You can have one of your ships on one side, one of your ships on the other, and now the enemy is quite easily surrounded. And even if you aren't able to pull that off, your opponent has to think about the possibility of someone doing that at some point during your boarding action. Of course, you do as well, uh, but in theory, if you're the one making the attack, you're a little bit more confident about it than the person you're attacking. And with a lack of any form of reliable battlefield signalling beyond maybe a few prearranged trumpet blasts, it would be very difficult to call in a portion of your fleet from elsewhere to come and help you, even if you had overall numerical superiority. And so a relatively fixed pattern of tactics would develop for most large-scale naval combat of this period. Namely, one side, the defending side, would tend to lash all of their ships together or a good portion of them at least. This meant two things. One, 
you were limiting the enemy's options as to where they could board you because a forest of prows or sterns pointing towards them was somewhat more difficult to board than the in theory two broadsides at either end of your lashed together column and it meant that almost everybody in all of the ships you'd lashed together was available to fight which in theory gave you a better defensive position and also a bit more tactical depth because you could fall back to ships closer into the centre if you were perhaps losing the fight on one particular vessel. The great cost of this tactic was of course mobility. That long line of lashed together ships wasn't going anywhere fast and so both fleets would have outrider vessels, small fast agile ships usually armed with a high proportion of archers to try again to whittle down the enemy crew. The attacking fleet of course would try to ward if they could perhaps try to mob two or three ships boarding the ends of the column, try to break up the line of ships, or perhaps try some kind of boarding action along the line, even if a high prow and an uncertain amount of space between the two prows might make that quite difficult. The fact that most fleets would tend to stick somewhat close to the coast unless they were in transit to or from the enemy territory also meant that a large number of these fights would take place either off the coast or in a bay of some kind, which usually would contain something that the defending fleet was trying to protect, which helped with the development of this kind of land battle at sea tactic. Now, that's not to say it's the only battle tactic. If fleets encountered each other in the more open ocean, they would have to fight in a somewhat more open formation, simply because lashing yourselves in a long line in the middle of the sea just invited yourselves to be surrounded and picked off. But those fights tended to be a lot more chaotic and a lot less predictable. And even within that, whilst you might not lash many ships together, you might see two or three ships lash each other together for mutual support if they found themselves under concerted attack, or at the very least small units of ships forming impromptu squadrons and staying close enough together to make someone slipping between them to double team one individual ship much, much harder. Of course, in the Mediterranean where galleys predominated, ramming tactics that were perhaps somewhat more reminiscent of the Greco-Persian wars were still much more the order of the day, but much like the Byzantine tactics, that kind of warfare for the most part will need its own video. These kind of tactics would then persist for hundreds of years, even as ships developed. Indeed, even at something like the Battle of Sluis, which is considered to be well into the medieval period, lashing large numbers of ships together to form a defensive front and try and goad the enemy into attacking you was the default plan, to start with at least, for the French ships. But there was development in the ships themselves. The general trend, interrupted only very occasionally for the next millennia or so, was for ships to get larger. Additionally, whilst having roving projectile launching ships was somewhat helpful, those ships were somewhat more vulnerable if they got caught and boarded, and also were somewhat specialist in their employment. And the ability to have consistent archer cover during a boarding action, whether you were being boarded or you were boarding the enemy, was seen as very useful, at least in times of war, because dedicated warships were somewhat thin on the ground if you go from the period of, say, 1000 AD through to about 1400. The flip side to that was that there were quite a lot of pirates around and so the average merchant ship tended to be somewhat better prepared to handle itself than in eras of perhaps slightly more peace. As the ships got larger their masts and rigging also became somewhat more substantial and thus you had the evolution of the fighting top. This was also sometimes called a crow's nest in some literature but it provided a good spotting platform which was good for navigation as well as combat but it also meant that you could have archers up there who could continue to shoot at the enemy without the pesky annoyance of some heavily armoured individual turning up with a battle axe and trying to cleave their head in two. But you could only fit so many men in a fighting top, and you know if the mast came down that could be somewhat problematic. You also had the problem that once an enemy had boarded your ship, it was pretty much a level playing field in terms of where you were fighting. And so a combination of these pressures saw the development of what would become known as the fore castle and after or stern castle. The latter designation was gradually faded mostly from collective memory, 
but the former designation has actually stuck around in the form of the term folksal, which is a shortened version of for castle, which these days designates the front of the ship, but back in those days designated this new kind of fortification. And it, they were called castles because at the time a lot of modern bailey style castles were still built of wood so there wasn't that contradiction and they also had battlements and in the cases of the larger ships even walls connecting them to the main deck the idea of these fighting platforms at least in defense was twofold one your slightly more vulnerable but very useful archers and other such could be congregated on the upper part of these castles where they could provide covering fire over the heads of the crew from a position of safety if you were being boarded. And for the ships that were lucky enough to have these fore and after castles built up to such an extent that they weren't just crenellated fighting platforms suspended above the main deck of the ship but actually had, as we said, wooden walls extending down to the deck of the ship, they also provided a kind of last redoubt where if your main deck looked like it was being overwhelmed by enemy borders, you could retreat back into these, thus providing a choke point which your reduced crew might be able to hold, whilst your archers above could still rain down fire and death on the enemy that was trying to attack you. If you, in turn, were boarding the enemy, then these platforms still provided a vantage point from which your archers could launch projectiles at the enemy, again over the heads of your own troops, which made it somewhat safer. And if there was a size discrepancy between the ships, they might also provide the platform you needed to actually get up to the enemy's main deck if you were attacking from a smaller vessel. Alternatively, if you were attacking from a larger vessel, it gave you a kind of high ground from which to fight downwards towards the enemy. And before you think that sounds too fanciful, there are multiple accounts from early medieval naval battles of knights in pretty much full armour jumping down from fore and after castle platforms onto the decks or the castles of enemy ships, partly, it seems, just to have made an impact, literally, on the enemy crew. Of course, this was all well and good if you were the ship with the castles and the enemy ship wasn't, so... Pretty soon, everybody had castles, including, as we said, the merchant ships, because the line between merchant ship and warship at this point was um, very fuzzy, and an awful lot of fleets, when a large fleet was mustered, would be made up in large part of merchant ships that had just been stuffed with a few more fighting men than they perhaps might otherwise have carried. Once both sides had castles installed on their ships, it then became a matter of, well, now the castle's troops, mostly, again, archers and other such men, would need to suppress the troops on the enemy castles and fighting tops, obviously. And since two ships of roughly equal size might have castles at roughly equal heights, you might then have boarding actions taking place between the castles as well, because as much as a full-built wooden castle on a ship might provide a last redoubt against enemy boarding action if you were the one being boarded, if you were attacking and you managed to take the upper deck of the enemy castle, then of course you held the superior position and you could fight down into the enemy's last redoubt, thus occupying it, and then hit them from two sides, from within the fore or after castle, depending on which one you'd taken, and in a more conventional action across the deck where there would be more width so you could bring more force to bear. As ship design evolved, one of the primary defensive measures that would be built into ships that were perhaps more designed for war than not was simply to make the ships more high-sided, because that meant it was much harder for the enemy to board you and gave you a position of greater advantage when it came to throwing or firing things down onto the enemy's deck. The castles themselves would therefore also be higher, providing them with an even greater vantage point, and people would start to put things like anti-boarding nets on the decks of their own ships or across the decks of their own ships in order to entangle and therefore upset an enemy attack which could then be mown down from the safety of the castles. If your main deck only had a small amount of bulwarking then this net would usually be on the deck itself and the crew would just have to be very careful about picking their way across it. If the bulwarks were relatively high as would develop in some of the early galleon type vessels then this net would be strung above the deck to catch people that were trying to board in a kind of giant spider's web. So by this point, what you might think of as the classic Viking, Saxon, Norman longship had evolved into what's most commonly called a cog or hulk in the medieval period, which was now progressing into a carrack and thence into a galleon. But now, as you reach the end of the 14th and the start of the 15th century, 
gunpowder becomes a lot more prevalent and with it cannon. Now I'm not going to go exhaustively through the list of various naval guns. We have in fact a video on the development of early naval guns separate to this one. But when the first cannon came about, people who were trying to mount them on ships faced something of a problem. You couldn't have a broadside in the way that you might think of classically, because apart from anything else, ships of this period had a much shorter length to breadth ratio. So there just wasn't that much space along the side of a ship. Also, as we mentioned, a lot of ships would ply a peaceful trade in peacetime and then perhaps be used as warships in wartime and having a lot of guns down the side of your ship or both sides of your ship would occupy an awful lot of space in the valuable area of the ship where you might want to be otherwise storing your cargo and there was perhaps a much more pressing issue the decks of ships were not designed to carry the weight of these big heavy guns which may weigh several tons apiece and of course would exert a point load Guns were also very expensive, so you weren't going to be mass manufacturing them anytime soon. And so very quickly, the first ships that would mount guns saw them divided into effectively a minor and major category. The minor category was a series of small anti-personnel weapons, which could be handled by one man and would be used, as their name suggests, to take out enemy crewmen. A number of these could even be mounted in such a position that most of their fire arc was actually over their own deck. This was to counter enemy boarding actions, especially if you'd had to retreat to the redouts of your fore and after castles. But there was one area in most ships which either could take the load of several tons of bronze or iron, or could be made to take that with relatively minimal modification. And these areas were the bow and stern. This was because as the bow and stern narrowed, there was less space horizontally between the frames if you were looking at the ship from side to side. And you also had the upward sweep of the keel fore and aft, which meant that there was a closer proximity of heavy structural timbers that made up the main frame of the ship. Of course, this also meant there was relatively little space in these areas. And so if you were going to install guns, there weren't going to be that many of them, which lent itself to putting in the biggest ones you could, which, you know, you probably want to do anyway, but it became something of a happy feedback loop. Over in the areas where galleys were more predominant, there was an additional concern, because although galleys did have a length to breadth ratio that might suggest that they'd be more suitable for broadside firing, being galleys, they of course had their broadsides occupied by other things, namely oars and oarsmen, and so even in galleys, the majority, if not the entirety, of their gun-based armament would be mounted in the bow. But returning to our carracks and early galleons, as well as bow-mounted guns, which were quite useful for offence, because whilst you were sailing at the enemy, you could obviously fire the guns at them, and perhaps for some stern guns, because if you were being chased by the enemy, you probably wanted to be able to put some firepower into them, there began to be a small number of broadside mounted guns. Again, the space constraints caused by having a relatively short length to beam ratio did mean that there were relatively few in number, and because of the weight constraints by caused by having the weaker decks, they tended to be lighter than the much heavier bow and stern guns. But as time went on, and again ship sizes progressed, and people began to strengthen the decks of ships, these amidships guns could be made somewhat heavier, and you began to see the development of perhaps ships that could be described as more dedicated warships. This happened for a number of reasons, including political reasons and pride reasons, but one of the more practical reasons was, as we mentioned before, having lots of guns amidships would cut into your ability to carry cargo, which made this less practical for merchant shipping, and also guns were pretty expensive, which meant that a merchantman probably wasn't going to sink massive amounts of his own money into a bunch of weapons that cut down on his ability to carry cargo and therefore make more money when there was a possibility, one, that he wouldn't need to use them for long periods of time, and two, if he did need to use them, well, you know, there were now ships that were quite heavily equipped, which his ship wouldn't stand a chance against if it was underarmed. 
This isn't to say that merchant ships didn't carry guns. They very much did because pirates were still very much a threat. But the difference between a warship and a merchant vessel in terms of full-on combat capability was now beginning to see a bit of a divergence. Over in the Mediterranean, again just briefly commenting on the state of combat in that area, there was also the development of the galleass, this being a kind of hybrid between the galley and the more heavily gun-armed carrack or galleon, where the forecastle and stern castle of a large galley-type ship would have numerous guns installed, including a few heavy ones, and you might even get a few light guns installed on a partial deck above the rowing deck down the sides. At this point, remaining static and bound together was a bad idea because your enemy could now pretty much lay siege to you, just f slowly firing their heavy guns from their bows until they'd smashed either enough of your ship or enough of your crew to pieces to be able to move in and seize your vessel. But the relatively slow rate of fire of the guns that were available at this stage, combined with the fact there just weren't that many of them, meant that whilst guns could now threaten the structural integrity of ships and do an awful lot of damage to their crews, boarding was still very much a thing. Indeed, with the relative mobility of ships now that they were freed up from the somewhat more constricted battle tactics that would now be a bit more suicidal, a trend tended to develop amongst a number of navies of one broadside, or bow salvo, and board, with the idea that that salvo would do enough damage to ship and crew on the opponent's side so that your subsequent boarding action could follow up and take them before they were able to counter you with a broadside or bow salvo or stern salvo of their own, or indeed much fire from their lighter guns that might do a significant amount of damage to your boarding parties. But in this period, naval tactics for squadron fleet actions were a little bit all over the place. Sometimes people would try and go straight for the boarding actions. Sometimes there would be a, relatively speaking, extensive cannonade as one side tried to gain the advantage over the other. But perhaps one of the best examples of just how vulnerable ships that were static had now become to cannon can be seen in the ambush of Francis Drake and John Hawkins at San Juan de Alua. The small Spanish fleet that turned up in the harbour was more heavily armed, better equipped, and overall in an open ocean combat should have won. But because they were moored up and relying primarily on infantry-based boarding tactics to win the day, it meant that when the English got wind of this assault and decided to try and fight back, the old Jesus of Lubeck, which was pretty much the only ship that the English had that could stand a chance against the larger Spanish vessels that were in the harbour, was able to systematically reduce at least two of the heavily armed Spanish ships to splinters and fire and damage a few others, simply because they were moored and the Jesus of Lubeck could use its heavy bow guns to systematically blow them apart. Now, going into the 16th century, you began to see a divergence in tactics quite significantly between various nations. People like the Spanish, for example, who by now had a lot of large galleons, still preferred the one or two salvos and then board style. They had big galleons, they had an advantage in boarding actions, they had a lot of very ferocious battle-hardened troops, and so softening the enemy up with a single salvo and then relying on your superior hand-to-hand -hand combat skills seemed to be the way to go, rather than engage in a perhaps prolonged cannonade where, at least as far as they were concerned, less valuable men, like sailors, might pick apart large numbers of your very expensive, very well-equipped, very well-trained veteran troops simply by flinging enough stone and iron through the air. But for navies who were perhaps on the receiving end of Spanish attention, like the Dutch and the English, their ships weren't as numerous and in most cases weren't as large, and so it was against their interest to engage in this kind of combat. And so they started to settle on perhaps a more gun-based combat, for precisely the reasons that the Spanish didn't want to engage in it. But whilst what we might recognise as a line of battle had occasionally been used up till this point, there was still a lack of rate of fire and concentration of fire, still caused by a relatively short length to beam ratio and, you know, just the fact that people hadn't really worked out how to fire their guns particularly quickly as compared to later eras, and thus the amount of damage you could do 
over any given amount of time was relatively limited if you were going to use just one broadside. Thus, the new tactic that was predominant amongst ships that were looking more for a gun-based solution to combat was what you might term a carousel or pirouette. And you'd see this quite a bit during the pursuit of the Armada up the English Channel. This would occur when a ship would sail towards its target, it would unleash its bow guns, and it would then wheel on the spot. So if, say, you were wheeling to starboard, you'd expose your port broadside, you'd give the enemy a taste of that, you'd continue your wheel around, you'd fire your stern guns, you'd continue around still further, fire your starboard broadside, and then, depending on how quickly that manoeuvre was executed and how well your crews were performing, you'd either be coming round so that your bow guns were reloaded and you could continue this process of effectively a slow but steady bombardment of a handful of cannonballs here and there with your ship circling in place and able to break off when necessary. Or if your manoeuvre was perhaps conducted relatively quickly or your guns were taking longer to reload, once you'd done your full 360, you would head off to reload all your guns and come back in and try again. This approach was relatively good at keeping you safe, but it did take a lot of time to inflict any kind of serious damage, as again the Armada is a good example of, because as the English fleet, which actually outnumbered the Armada, pursued it up the channel, relatively little damage was actually done and relatively few Spanish ships fell out of formation. In fact, the biggest ships that fell out of formation were largely down to faults within the Spanish fleet themselves. Fires, explosions and collisions. During this period, mobbing your fleet together had sort of resurged as a defensive tactic. It wasn't the lashing of every ship together in an immobile mass of previous centuries, but, again using the Spanish Armada as an example, a sort of crescent shape was actually relatively useful, because if an enemy ship came in to attack, you could concentrate the fire of numerous of your own ships against them, which hopefully would drive them off, and if they were a bit, little bit too foolish and they came a little bit too close, there was enough cumulative firepower in this close formation to actually do serious damage to the enemy ship's hull over a relatively short period of time, down masts, blow away rudders, etc., which would then allow one or more of your ships to move in and capture the crippled enemy vessel, or perhaps just sink and destroy it if you so were inclined. It was at this point that you saw a very rare event. Warships didn't keep growing in size. What are sometimes termed the race-built galleons broke with, at this point, about half a millennia of tradition by cutting down the size of the fore and stern castles. The ships also lay somewhat lower in the water in terms of their overall freeboard between the waterline and the main deck. Whilst this did make the ships more vulnerable in a boarding action as compared to the high-sided galleons of old, it also made them faster and more agile, which meant they were more able to stay away from being boarded in the first place, which allowed them to work their guns for a lot longer and do a lot more damage to the enemy. But time rolls on and technology advances. The destructive power of guns was becoming more and more appreciated, and gun availability was also becoming more and more common thanks to the development of reliable iron guns, which were a lot cheaper, and to a certain extent somewhat easier to make, than the older, much more expensive bronze cannon, even though bronze cannon did remain the epitome of naval artillery for perhaps another century and a half. And thus, in the period between the Spanish Armada and the First and subsequent Second Anglo-Dutch Wars, ship design began to evolve ships became longer compared to their beam, so their length to beam ratio went up. This obviously allowed more guns to be mounted on the broadside, which made the smaller number of perhaps heavier guns on the bow and stern less important. Ships had also grown to a size where you could get multiple decks of guns, at this point usually two, down the side of a ship, which obviously increased the effective firepower broadside still more, because if you were doubling up, say, 14 or 20 guns, this could increase your broadside to 28 or 40 weapons, whereas the same increase in height in the bow or stern might increase your firepower from 2 or 3 guns to 4 to 6 guns. The disadvantage of this was that the longer ships were less agile than their shorter, stouter cousins, and since ships of this period lacked any form of real bulkhead, 
it meant that if one of these new high firepower ships, or to be honest, even one of the older ones, managed to cut across your bow or stern, they could undertake what was known as raking fire. You would have only a few bow or stern guns, so your counter battery fire would be somewhat ineffective, and in any case would punch through only a relatively small volume of the enemy ship. Whereas their firepower, as well as helps having a lot more guns as they broadsided you, would travel down the length of your own ship, which meant that the chance of interacting with one of your crew, or many of your crew, and or some of your guns, was significantly higher, and so raking fire would be incredibly devastating. But it was something of a paradox, because the very thing that made raking fire so devastating, the longer broadside, was the thing that had caused you to be vulnerable in the first place by making you less agile. The solution to this, it seemed, was to adapt the tactic that had been toyed with earlier, the line of battle. This was effectively, as it sounds, where ships formed a line for battle, bow to stern. The objective was that by lining all your ships up you had a huge number of guns pointing at the enemy, and each ship was protecting its respective partner's bow or stern, except of course for the end ship and the lead ship. But then the whole formation would navigate together, and you'd fight the enemy, because presumably they were also scared of this happening. And so everyone forms lines, you sail next to each other, everybody shoots at each other, and eventually, presumably, somebody is declared a winner. If you can cross the T of the other person's line, that is, you can effectively pull a raking manoeuvre, but on a fleet scale level, then obviously that's good. But given that the effective range of cannon could be measured in hundreds of yards, whereas visual range could be measured in tens of thousands of yards on a good day, a fleet that normally tried to cross the T of the enemy fleet could be countered by the fleet that was at risk simply turning to parallel them. Now, even in fleet actions, this didn't stop other kinds of action from occurring. Small groups of ships could end up fighting each other in relatively pell-mell conditions, especially because fleets of this period could actually be very large. You could have high tens or even low hundreds of ships facing off against each other in single major battles, such as characterise some of the later Anglo-Dutch wars. And if the enemy fleet hadn't had the chance to form a line of battle, and you had overwhelming numerical superiority, again, you'd probably want to descend on them as quickly as you could before they got a chance to form a line and defend themselves, because the one big disadvantage of the line of battle was that it took a very, very long time to set up, especially back in the day when the kind of codified signalling system that we're used to in the 19th and 20th centuries didn't exist yet. But once you'd formed a line of battle, there were quite a few ways that people could try to use to actually get into gun range, because you try and form your line outside of gun range, and then bring all your guns to bear. But if you're sailing in two parallel lines, that's never going to happen. So sometimes you'd have fleets sailing parallel to each other in the same direction, and one fleet would start to edge in towards the other. Now, this had the advantage of obviously you're taking the initiative, but it also meant that the vanguard of your fleet, uh, i.e. the front, would be subjected to perhaps a bit more fire than they could dish out until the rest of your fleet caught up. Alternatively, you could have two fleets set up their own lines at and sail towards each other. This would become a passing engagement, where the two lines sailed past each other and gunned at each other all, uh, all the way along. Um, if you had a situation where the two fleets were in parallel but one fleet was behind in pursuit, then in theory, again, you could gradually overhaul the enemy formation. And all of these had their advantages and disadvantages. If you had a straight parallel line battle, where both sides kind of came together semi naturally, then it would be decided by weight and rate of fire on both sides and the durability of both sides' ships as a whole. If you went head-to-head, -head, then it was relatively unlikely that a decision would be incredibly decisive, because it would be a passing engagement, it wouldn't last that long, unless one or the other side decided to turn around and come back for another go. But it meant that the lead ships would be subjected to the fire of pretty much every ship in the enemy fleet as they went past. So whatever happened, your lead ships would get quite badly chewed up. On the other hand, obviously you had a bunch of other ships coming up to support them. In a chase-style situation, 
it could go either way because the chasing ships would have their lead ships overtake the rear enemy ships. Now, that could be bad for the chasing fleet at first because, again, the lead ships would engage the rearmost enemy ships and then they'd have to advance and engage the middle enemy ships and they'd have to continue advancing to allow the rest of the fleet to come up and engage the van, which would mean that, once again, the lead ships got very battered. But on the other hand, it also meant the enemy's rear vessels would be engaged by your entire fleet as they came past. So depending, again, on the skill levels and durability of various ships, you might end up where the chasing fleet has its front mangled and has to fall back, no longer has a numerical advantage, and their line is broken as they try and dodge around the crippled ships. Or you might have a situation where the chasing fleet is able to disable a few ships in the enemy's rear and effectively swallow them back into the rest of the fleet, take them over and repeat the process, nibbling their way up the line. And both situations played out in various battles. One of the advantages of a chasing engagement, if captains were clever, was of course that they could split their forces and come up with both sides of an enemy line that was trying to escape, which would tend to increase their advantage. Some admirals would risk trying to break the enemy line in one place or another, especially if they spotted a gap, but this kind of behaviour was incredibly risky because it ended up usually breaking up your own line. And if it went wrong, which occasionally it would, then you could have some very ugly scenarios where a still mostly intact line of battle could mercilessly gun down large numbers of the enemy fleet. And so the line of battle tended to become more and more codified as time went on. There were various provisions in various navies for what to do when a line of battle wasn't able to be formed for whatever reason, but they mostly had to do with absolute emergencies, if you were the one being attacked, or situations where it seemed that you had such an overwhelming advantage that a line of battle wouldn't serve you particularly well at all, um, for example, if the enemy fleet was disorganised and fleeing, you might as well hoist a general chase because then you'll still mob and overhaul a few of the enemy rather than forming a line of battle which might take you several hours up to half a day and then find the enemies disappeared over the horizon so whilst you hold the field of battle you haven't got any reward for it. Now it's important to note that whilst in the Napoleonic Wars you did have a step away from line of battle tactics, at least with the Royal Navy, especially in the form of Nelson, this is perhaps a slightly misleading set of circumstances if you just look at it on the face of it. Normally, the kind of tactics that Nelson took wouldn't work. The kind of tactics he used at Trafalgar, if he'd been facing off against a fleet of equal competence in terms of rate of fire and accuracy of fire, would not have worked. Because to charge an enemy line of battle effectively means you're inviting them to rake your ships as they come in. And if your enemy can fire quickly enough and accurately enough, they can disable your ships as they come into gun range, and then the following ships will try and manoeuvre around those crippled ships, and then they'll be disabled, and so on, and eventually you'll end up with a glut of disabled ships with what's left of the charging fleet stuck behind them, which isn't good. In the Napoleonic Wars, Nelson and other British captains took specific advantage of the fact that the French and later Franco-Spanish fleets didn't have the training to maintain a high level of fire or a very accurate level of fire and thus charging through a much lesser full assad of iron could just about work in many cases. Whilst a highly aggressive approach was encouraged, the fact was that better, faster, more agile ships and a better signalling system also meant that it was possible to control groups of ships in a much better way than had been possible before and thus, whilst the line of battle would be relaxed somewhat, it didn't go away entirely, as you might get the impression from just looking at something like Trafalgar. Because one of the other major factors as to why a line of battle was so efficient during the 17th and 18th centuries was simply that without that developed system of flag signalling, getting someone to get in a line and follow the leader was about the best way of actually maintaining control of a fleet. A number of battles in that time period went down to indecisive actions, which no one was particularly happy about, precisely because limited signalling meant that the few signals that were hoisted were 
somewhat open to misinterpretation and could lead to a lot of hesitancy amongst both sides. But within the scope of the Age of Sail line of battle, there was one other major factor to consider, and that was the weather. You could have what was called the weather gauge, and this was held to be the better thing to have. Now, the weather gauge basically meant that the wind would blow onto your ships, carry past your ships, and then to the enemy. The reason why this was held to be such a great advantage was because a sailing ship cannot sail directly into the wind. And thus, if you are holding the weather gauge, or you are upwind of the enemy, you can control when you want to sail with the wind towards the enemy, so you can control when you make the engagement. They can't come to you if you don't want them to, because they can't sail into the wind. And the only option they have at that point, therefore, is to either fight you or run away. And if they run away, well, you know, you've got the wind behind you, you can go after them. And unless they get back to a safe port or they give you a slip, they'll just end up in the same situation as they had been in before. The only downside of having the weather gauge was that if the wind was a little bit too strong, the wind would obviously exert force on the sails, which would cause the ship to heel away from the wind, which meant that your broadside that you were aiming at the enemy would be somewhat aimed at the enemy's hull, it would be pointed down a little bit, which was good, again, if the wind's not too strong. If it was a bit too strong, now your ship's healing to a point where your lower gun ports might be at risk of going into the water, which would mean you'd lose access to your heaviest guns. The flip side was that the enemy fleet that would be in the lee gauge, i.e. downwind, wouldn't have this problem, because their ships would also be healing away from the wind, but that meant that the wind side, which was the side facing you, would be up out of the water, and that meant their guns were well clear, they could use all of them, but it also meant that if you weren't careful, again, if the wind was a little bit too strong, those guns would be pointed a bit too high, so they'd shoot up your rigging and mast quite a bit, but they wouldn't really have much of a chance of doing damage to your hull and your crew. However, for particularly aggressive captains and navies, as happened in the Napoleonic War period of the 18th century, a new tactic was developed of engaging from the lee side. Now, that might sound a little bit counterintuitive, given the advantages that we've just discussed. However, improvements to the designs of ships, including the deployment of large numbers of triangular fore and aft lateen sails, meant that ships were progressively more and more capable of sailing not directly into the wind, but certainly much closer to the wind than they had been previously, which meant that a fleet in the lee could beat against the wind up to engage a ship that had or a fleet that had the wind gauge. It was much slower and more laborious than just descending on the enemy fleet with the wind, but it could be done. The advantage of being in the lee position was that, once again, if you were in a wind that wasn't too strong, you were pretty much guaranteed to have all your gun ports exposed. The other problem, obviously, with having a very high wind level was a very high wind level would cause waves to smash against your ship, which could flood you, but never mind. But if you were in the lee position, whilst your enemy, to a degree, might be able to come down on you a bit faster, it meant they had nowhere to run. They couldn't beat against the wind any better than you could, at which point the position is not really changed. If they wanted to run away from you, they'd have to run with the wind, but if they ran with the wind, they'd run straight into you, which is what you wanted. And so, whether or not you cho chose to fight with the weather gauge or in the lee gauge, in a lot of ways in the edge of sail became a mark of how aggressive and confident you were, or if you'd just been boxed in by an enemy. But what temporarily disrupted the line of battle as a favoured tactic were two things, the development of steam propulsion on warships and the development of armoured warships. Steam propulsion meant that, to a certain degree, battles could be fought independently of the weather, and also ships could progress at a reliable, and for the time, relatively high speed. This meant that the danger time that was involved in getting from the maximum effective range of a ship's guns, which could vary between about 700 to 1,000 yards, maybe up to a mile and a half on a really good day, and up close and personal combat, was significantly reduced. 
which allowed for the kind of line-breaking tactics that Nelson had pioneered to be seriously considered. On top of that, the development of armour meant that for most of that previous danger zone, there wasn't a danger zone, because at the longer ranges the guns would just bounce off the armour. And so you had engagements like the Battle of Lissa, where Tegethoff's fleet was able to charge in a series of wings down into an Italian fleet that was arranged in a line of battle. If that had happened between two fleets of approximately equal skill in the Age of Sail, Tegethoff's forces would have been cut to pieces. But between the speed of their approach and the fact their armour protected them for a good chunk of the way in, they were able to pull off the kind of mass melee battle that would have made Nelson proud, and of course Tegethoff came off the winner. But as guns became more powerful and longer range, and then fire control systems came in that allowed them to exploit the maximum potential of that range towards the end of the 19th, the beginning of the 20th centuries, the kind of more free-spirited action you might have seen in a mid to late 19th century naval battle gradually became replaced by the resurgence of the line of battle. And this was for a number of reasons. The extended range of guns meant that the time to cross the danger space had grown once again, but also whereas in the Age of Sail raking fire would primarily have damaged the ship's crews, by the time of the late 19th and early 20th centuries what you might call raking fire was far more likely to have a significant detrimental impact on the structure of the ship itself through the sheer power of the shells, both in terms of just blowing holes in the ship, setting fire to the ship, or potentially even detonating the magazines. Whilst ships that were closing in on the enemy ha could bring to bear considerably more of their own firepower in terms of their main turret armament as compared to ships of the line in the Age of Sail, the individual cost of being hit by a large calibre shell had also gone up quite a bit, and an enemy that was broadside onto you could normally, at least in that time period, bring at least twice as many guns to bear on you as you could bring to bear on them. As ships developed amidships turrets, then this changed again, so the broadside got an even greater advantage. As you went from World War I to World War II and ships began to adopt triple layouts with six guns forward and three aft, the forward battery became slightly heavier, but there were still more shells coming in at you than you were putting out the other way, and as we said, a single hit could be quite devastating. The other problem for a good chunk of the early 20th century was the fire control systems themselves. A lot of them couldn't handle very rapid changes in course and bearing. So sailing in two lines where the change in course, bearing and speed between the two ships or the two fleets was relatively static meant that you could hit people at 10, 15, 20,000 yards. Whereas if an enemy ship was coming in towards you at fairly high speed and was zigging and zagging all over the place, getting an exact fix on where you should be shooting at the longer distances would be very difficult. And for the ship that was doing the zigging and the zagging, it would also be very difficult to hit the target that they were going for, until both sides were at such close range that perhaps leading the target wasn't really too much of a concern, but by that point you'd be in such close range that you could just smash each other to kindling very, very quickly, which wasn't the kind of battle with an advantage to one side or the other that either captain would be seeking. And so, in World War I and the interwar period, the line of battle became once again the default setting. The last stand of the gun-armed warship, with guns as its primary armament, was of course World War II, but in World War II, the situation was a little bit difficult. Every single battle from the time that cannon had become widespread up to the end of World War I had involved fleets which were large enough to form a line of battle. But by the time of World War II, between things like Pearl Harbor, treaty-restricted fleet sizes, and the Royal Navy having to be scattered across multiple oceans, there simply weren't enough ships to form what you'd recognise as a proper line of battle. Occasionally, a, a small line of two or three ships would form, but to describe it as a line 
is perhaps a bit generous. It would be more a, a series of ships following each other in a loose formation. Battle lines would sometimes make an appearance when you had large numbers of destroyers or cruisers facing off against each other, but even then, the high speed and manoeuvrability of ships by the time of World War II meant that whilst a formal line action would sometimes take place, quite often what might start as a formal line action, if indeed there ever was one, would quickly degenerate into the kind of mass brawl that, once again, would be more familiar to someone of Nelson's time. The other problem with a line of battle in World War II was that it presupposed that both sides were actually willing to stand and fight, which assumed that everybody had a reasonable confidence of victory. Whereas with the relatively low numbers of capital ships overall and their widespread distribution, quite often naval battles would involve one side or the other very rapidly coming to the conclusion that they were at a significant disadvantage and they didn't want to be there and thus either breaking off the action or seeking to alter the action in some way that didn't involve sailing broadside to broadside with a significantly superior enemy until one of them exploded. There was also the small issue of the high risk of torpedo or air attack, especially in World War II, which tended to discourage ideas like putting all your valuable ships in one nice neat long line, where if a submarine launched a bunch of torpedoes at one ship and overshot or undershot, well, there's always another target for those torpedoes to hit, or indeed for dive bombers to sort of set up on the middle of your enemy fleet. And, you know, if they dived at too shallow or too steep an angle, well, again, there was always another target in line. And that's as far as the channel goes. So with that, we shall bring to an end this video. Hopefully you've enjoyed this very high-level look at the general trends in naval tactics and why they existed in the last thousand years or so, up to the end of World War II. Of course, as mentioned, there are lots of individual variations, especially in small squadron and single ship actions, but even in the larger fleet actions, there are always exceptions that tend to prove the rule across the entire time period. Perhaps over time we'll return and look at specific time periods and how tactics developed and changed in individual actions. And of course we do have to look at how things went in the Mediterranean, where the long-lived nature of galleys and other similar vessels had some fairly major impacts on how they did things. And of course, if at some point we can find people who know significant amounts about how Japanese, Chinese, Vietnamese or Indian tactics went, maybe we'll talk about them as well. But for now, thanks very much for listening. See you later. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.